Matthew 6, 1 through 4. Be especially careful when you are trying to be good so that you don't make a performance out of it. It might be good theater, but the God who made you won't be applauding. When you do something for someone else, don't call attention to yourself. You've seen them in action, I'm sure. Play actors, that's what I call them. Treating prayer, meeting, and street corner alike as a stage. Acting compassionate as long as someone is watching. Playing to the crowds. They get applause, true, but that's all they get. When you help someone out, don't think about how it looks. Just do it. Quietly and un unobtrusively. That is the way your God, who conceived you in love, working behind the scenes, helps you out. I got to preach in series a few months ago. Um, since then, it had been four years since I had preached, so this is my second time in four years. So I'm going to ask for a ton of grace from you guys, um, and I'm going to pray again. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your love, and God, I thank you for what you've taught me in this lesson, and I thank you for being persistent with me because sometimes I'm hard-headed, and I just thank you for the word that you've given me, Lord. And Father, I just ask that you speak through me, soften our hearts to what the Holy Spirit has to say. And Father, that it be all about you. We give you the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right. So I had um, Sister Lupe read that out of the message because I thought it was really pretty. But um, I was told that I'm not supposed to preach out of the message. So... <laughs> I've got um, the NRSV that we're going to go ahead and stand and read, if you guys don't mind. Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms... Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. This is the word of the God for the people of God. Thank you. You may be seated. So when studying the scripture, I really had to um, look at my own heart behind giving and being compassionate and kind to others. I had to acknowledge that I wasn't very good at giving. Um, alms are defined as money or charitable gifts. And so I thought to myself, what does it mean to be charitable? I know there's like this website on Facebook that I donate my stuff sometimes to like moms and, and kids that don't have anything or, or that they just want to pass along stuff to the different families. And I'm like, well, I do that, God. I donate. But wait a minute. Do I donate to give out of a pure heart, or do I just donate to give my stuff out of my house? I think I just donate to give the stuff out of my house. And so that's not really the right motivation. Um, but I think alms, alms is money or, or, or food or something charitable, but, but it goes beyond that. It's time, and it's care, and it's kindness for others. It's being charitable to others. And so as I was praying and thinking, I'm like, okay, Lord, what does that mean? Well, one day I was in my office, and there was a coworker that was um, coughing. And I felt, I felt the Holy Spirit say, you need to go give her water and cough drops. Okay, Lord, but I don't want to intrude on her. So I didn't, I wasn't obedient. I wasn't obedient because I didn't want to intrude on her and I only had a couple cough drops left. And I eat them like candy, so there's that. 
So later I was in Costco that day, and I felt really convicted about it, though. I know it was just cough drops, but it, it was a big deal, the Holy Spirit. And I knew it was the Holy Spirit that said, go and give her cough drops. So I'm at Costco. I'm feeling all convicted. I'm, it's hot. It was like one of the first hottest days. And I'm going to my car, and I have frozen berries and milk and cheese, you know, the refrigerator stuff that I still have to take an hour away. And then God says, you need to go take that little old lady's cart back to the cart station. And I'm just like, Lord, what about my frozen berries? Uh, okay, Lord, I knew because I had felt convicted about the cough drops that I knew that the next time that the Holy Spirit spoke to me, I needed to listen. To be fair, every time the Holy Spirit speaks to me, I need to listen. So I took this little lady's cart, and my berries weren't completely defrosted by the time I got home. It only took a few minutes. But it was kind of inconvenient, you know? Like, I wanted to get on my way. And I was just thinking, how often is it convenient to give? I don't know that it is convenient to give, especially if we're not in the habit of doing it. So are we in the habit of listening to the Spirit when he calls us to do things for others and care for their needs. I know I need to work on it. But what does that look like for us? Do we know the sound of his voice? Um, after studying the scripture and, and really God's really spoke to me a lot on it, um, I keep feeling the nudge of the Holy Spirit. So I felt the nudge of the Holy Spirit to give coffee to one of the other ladies in my, in my job um, just to bless her you know, and it was a blessing for her, but, but my point in bringing up coffee for the ladies that I work with is that do we hear the Spirit of God? Like, he didn't yell at me, Melissa, go bring her a cup of coffee. You know, he didn't, he didn't pull out the bells and the whistles. It was just a nudge. It was just a really quiet, go make her a cup of coffee, a little nudge. I just felt like I needed to do it. For me, that's when the Holy Spirit's talking to me, that's how he does it. He does it gently. Looking back at the scripture, it says in verse 6, Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for you know you have no reward in heaven from your Father in heaven. You have no reward from your Father in heaven. So I looked up the word piety because I was really confused. So when I first got into church, I got this Bible, and it was a hardback Bible. I wouldn't suggest that. Get the floppy, the floppy ones. They're, they're much better because my hardback Bible, after a couple years of using it and highlighting and writing it, the pages are coming out. It's got duct tape all over it. Well, that was an NIV, and this is the NRSV. So um, it said righteousness in the NIV. And that can be defined as what's in harmony with the will of God and righteous deeds are those that are pleasing to him. But I had to look up piety because I really wasn't sure what it meant. Uh, piety can be described as religious acts, devout fulfillment of religious obligation, or reverence for God. Jesus instructs his, instructed his disciples not to put their piety on parade. Don't brag about it. Don't draw attention to yourself when it comes to your righteous deeds, especially when you give to the poor. I was thinking about the poor. You know, in America, we're all pretty, pretty rich compared to other places. Um, but sometimes we have people that are poor in heart or, or they really don't have anything. But how much humility does it take to receive a handout? I know I have been be blessed beyond measure and when I needed it the most. I learned early in my walk with the Lord not to rob somebody of their blessings. I had a lot of people bless us um, when we were growing up in the Lord. We didn't get saved. I say we, Pastor Josh and I, didn't get saved until we were in our late 20s. And so to know the Lord was very different. Um, we both had really low paying jobs at that time, and so it was really difficult to make rent, which I think about it, we paid $800 for rent for a three bedroom house, $800. <laughs> I 
and we couldn't afford that. That was our low paying jobs. Um, I think about that now and I'm just like, man, people, housing is ridiculous right now. So that's maybe one thing we need to pray about is for housing for people, especially if they don't have it. I got off on my notes, hold on a minute. Um, and humility. So when we give, we should do so quietly so that we don't become conceited and because the person we are giving might feel embarrassed. So I just, you know, when you give, just think about if you're spouting off, oh, I gave, I did this, and I provided for this person, like how does that make them feel? Like what kind of position does that put them in? And we don't want to put them in a negative position. We want them to be uplifted by our gifts. And we have to also know that God is the one that gives the gifts. When we take credit for something that God is be has been doing or that God is providing, then not only do we get the glory, but is somebody going to know that God is working in their lives, that he's drawing them to them, him to them, them to him? Um, it's very important that we know we do and say what God wants us to do and say. Um, are we giving on a regular basis when we see needs? Or have we trained our eyes to see the needs? Or have we conveniently shied away from looking at the unpleasantness in the world? You know, you walk down the street and you see the guy on the street corner, you know, asking for a handout. Do you see him? Like, do you look at his face? Do you look at him? Or do you just keep going? Do you avert yourself? Do you avert your eyes? I will be completely honest, most of the time I'm very, let's get to where I'm going. But it's important for us to see the needs. But it's not just the homeless folks that need our, our time and our attention and our resources. We have things in our own church that need to be tended to. We have, you know, um, single moms that might need a break. We have shut-ins that, you know, they need us to pray, they need us to go to go in and, and see them and provide for them. There's electric bills that need to get paid. You know, we, we don't know the needs. I, I don't know the needs, but are we looking for the needs? Are we caring for each other? I would challenge us to take, our care, take care of our own congregation so that the community will see our love for each other. Don't get me wrong, I think the community is significant. Going out into the community is very significant, but it's also important to take care of ourselves, our congregation. I want to read out of Acts 2, 40 through, 40 through 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe as the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they had continued to meet together in the temple. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So it's a community. We're a community of needs, and we need to have open eyes to be able to see those needs. The scripture, t scripture tells us not to practice our piety or religious devotion to be seen by others. It can be challenging to look at our motivations for giving. So I thought about different motivations, and this is kind of what I came up with. Are we motivated to get praise from others? If we're getting the glory from others for our gifts, we are paid in full. Like I just said a second ago, the glory should go to God because everything we have and everything we are comes from God. When we take credit for our giving, the person might miss out on what God is trying to encounter them. He should get the credit because ultimately he is the one that is caring for their needs. So we don't want to get in the way of what the Spirit is doing for somebody. Is our motive for giving to feel proud and good about ourselves? Do we feel proud? So right before I got saved, I started going to this little church on the west side of Modesto. If you guys don't know, that's the ghetto. And um, it, was, it was nice. I started going. I wasn't saved. I went with a friend, and she was doing the food pantry on Saturdays. So I went with her a couple of times. 
no big deal, you know, I get to feed the poor. Well, I, we're at a party, again, not saved yet. Um, Josh and I were at a party, and I overheard him tell one of our buddies, hey, Melissa fed the poor today. Oh, my goodness. I got so much pride well up in me. I was so proud of myself, and I'm like, oh, my husband's proud of me? But is that a good motive? So give that good feeling, oh, I give because it makes me feel so good. Well, that's great, but it's more about what's God doing. It's our motivation to please God. Do I expect something in return? Am I looking to gain love, attention, admiration, status, or payback? Are we trying to manipulate how others see us? Do we want others to think well of us? So I struggle with this one. Um, God really, so I've been preparing for this message for months. So if it's not going well, I really did put months into it, I promise. But um, I prayed about it for months. So God kept putting on my heart um, a specific thing, and I kept saying, no, Lord, I'm not going to share that because that's really close, and I don't feel like I had anything wrong with it. Like, I didn't feel like I was um, sinning, but he kept putting on my heart. I'm going to read it so I don't get it wrong. One of the things that came up for me when praying about this message, it was my adoption. I tend to be very open about my life. One of the first things, few things I tell people about myself is that I'm a pastor's wife, and that I've adopted four awesome kids. Why can't they just be four awesome kids? Why do they need to be adopted? I always get praised when they say, when I tell people that. Oh, you're so kind, or you're so good for them. And my response is, like, they are good for me. Like, I didn't do it for the praise. I did it for them. But I thought about my motive. Like, why... Why do I do that? Why do I, why do I have to be a pastor's wife and an, an adoptee, adopted mother? Well, I didn't do it for the praise, but I do it for the reputation. I want people to think well of me. I want them to know that I'm a good person. Um, I want them to know that I have four amazing kids and God's totally changed my life. But God really convicted me. It's not, you're not, not that God, they, people don't see those things in me when I, when I explain that, but more of what, what is my motivation? And at the end of the day, my motivation was to be thought well of, and that was not okay. So I repented. Um, I will continue to print, repent as it comes up, but it took months. It took months for God to get at me. I don't know if that's because I've got a really hard head and I'm really stubborn, and I don't know if you guys have ever experienced doing something and you're stubborn and it's hard for God to get a hold of you. Like, don't let me be the only one. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I, thank you. I feel much better. Not alone. Um, but I had to pray about it a lot. So when God puts something on your heart and when he keeps putting something on your heart and he keeps telling you, like every day he was telling me this would come up on my mind every single day. So I just kept praying about it. God, just let me have your motivation. Let me have your will. Explain to me why this keeps coming up on my brain. Um, and that's how we learn to hear his voice. Is our motivation to please God? What if my motivation is not to please God? It's very simple. Just pray. Ask to be convicted. Ask him to let you know, shine light on the places that are struggling or that need to be highlighted in what he's doing in your life. It's out of the overflow of your relationship with God that you will want to give with a pure heart. Matthew writes, So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly I tell you, you have received their reward. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. So like I said, alms is defined as money or food or other donations given to people in need, anything given in charity. So like I said, Pastor Josh and I, we had worked um, low-paying jobs, so we didn't have a whole lot. 
we lived in the Mojave Desert, and my cousin, who loves God, she loves God. I wasn't raised with her, and so when uh, she met me and we figured out we were cousins, she offered to let us move into her house to get us back home from the Mojave Desert. So it was really kind of her. Later, she told me that she was so nervous to rent to me because I didn't know the Lord. She didn't want to rent to me because I didn't know God, and I was very against God. And so she, but she did it anyway. She prayed and she rented to us anyway. Um, pretty soon, though, her ex wanted to move back in the house, so we got evicted, so to speak. So we had nowhere to go. Um, my brother-in-law and my sister-in-law, they let us live in their little two-bedroom house with three golden retrievers and two of us, no kids at that time. Um, but they were faithful to listen to God. They prayed about it, and they let us come live with them. Pretty soon, our pastor, talking to a neighbor, got us into another house that we could afford, um, but he prayed about it. The neighbor was gracious enough to give us an amount that we could afford. Um, they were obedient. So I have the youth group over my house one of these days at this new house that I can afford, and they're cleaning up the yard, and we're cleaning out the rooms. We're getting ready for what's called a home study. That's when the social workers come in and make sure your home's all in order so that they can give you children. So we're all working to get my house in order. And um, I, have, I have youth group all over my house just, you know, trashing stuff and just making things clean and whatnot. Well, sure enough, my landlord came to me that day right in the middle with everybody else and said, I'm selling this house. You have to move. Oh, man, I was so defeated because the social workers were, like, supposed to be there in, like, a month, and we were getting kids, and our whole life was about to change, and, and we were getting evicted again. So I went and I saw this house in Modesto, and the lady was Christian, and we told her, you know, oh, we're Christian. We, this is kind of our story. We can't really afford this house right now, but we really want to live here, and this is what's coming. Well, God had every detail planned out. I got a new job, so I was able to cash out my 401k to pay the rent and the first and last and the deposit um, and all this stuff. I had three dogs and so this person's like, I don't know if I'm going to rent to you. Let me pray about it. So sure enough, they prayed about it. And like three weeks later, three weeks of me going, oh, my gosh, where am I going to live? Where am I going to put these new kids that I'm going to get? Three weeks later, he, he calls me and he says that he prayed about it and he was going to rent that house to me. God is faithful. He is so faithful and he is so good. And he uses so many different people at different times and in different ways. We're so, so privileged to be able to have the Holy Spirit to let us be connected to that, to what he is doing. He used every one of those people to move us along in our faith. Because now I know, no matter what, I know God's going to provide, because I have a history with God providing. So uh, God will use you to teach people to trust him. Jesus is making a point here when he mentions the trumpet. One of the commentary I read said, there's an old evidence that during this period, the Jewish priests blew trumpets in the temple when they collected funds for special needs. So I can't help but think of the Princess Bride. You know, when they announce Princess Buttercup and the lady's like, boo, do it with me, boo. Yeah, just making sure you guys are awake. So I'm almost done, I promise. Uh, Royal, you will not be late. He's still here. Um, but I don't, okay, I didn't go back in the movie to see if they actually have trumpets to announce her, but that's how I hear it in my head. But trumpets draw attention. So, like, they draw attention to the American flag. In battles back in the day, they drew attention to the battle cry. Um, but Jesus is making a point. Um, not to not to draw attention to yourself when you give. And what can we compare it to? It might be different for everyone, but whatever draws attention to yourself when you give or do acts of kindness is a trumpet for you. Hypocrite. This is a common word in church language. 
sadly, it's, it's common language used to identify the church, too. We must be careful not to become hypocrites. The word means one who puts on a mask or feigns himself to be what he is not, a pretender in religion. Our Lord severely rebukes scribes and Pharisees for their hypo- hypo- hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. Job 8.13 says, The hypocrite's hope shall perish. The religious leaders' desire to be seen reflected what their hearts were and the impurity in their hearts and their selfishness. But Jesus puts it this way in Matthew 23, 28. On the outside, you appear to be people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. We have to be careful not to be hypocritical. We are to reflect God's image back into creation. God is a giving God. He is a good God. I realize that I forgot a part on my notes, and I want to go back to it because it's really important. When Jesus was telling his disciples to give with a pure heart, He wasn't commanding them to give. He was commanding them to give with the right motivation. Jesus already knew that he was going to get. They were going to give. That was an assumption because, as Jews, they were givers. As the people of God, we are givers. So this isn't telling you to give. It's saying when you give, when you give, have the right heart about it. Uh, Verse three and four. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So don't applaud yourself on the inside or talk about it and brag about it on the outside. Don't let your, le- don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Don't think about it too much. Just do it and move on. When we dwell on our good deeds, we become self-righteous. So in conclusion, some things to think about. How are we looking on the inside? Do we have selfish motivations? Do we give to be seen by others like the hypocrites, or do we have a pure heart that reflects the humility of God? Are we doing enough on the outside? Are we giving to those in need? Are we taking into consideration the people in our congregation that may need our support, as well as those in our community? And are we spending time with God to practice hearing his voice so that you are aware when he prompts you to give or to do something kind? So I'm going to go ahead and invite the worship team back up. Um, I want to leave you with this last quote, though, and then we're going to do communion. This quote says, Do not help the poor. Live and see with them. Be available to the poor. When we live with the poor, we move from aid to alliance, sympathy to solidarity. So I don't have the quote for that because I completely forgot to source it, but I had it on my paper and it was so good I couldn't leave it off. Father God, we love you so much. We thank you for this day that we've had, Lord. I just pray for your congregation as they go out to this next week, Lord God, and encounter people. I just pray for our hearts to be open and our ears to be open to the Holy Spirit, Lord. I thank you, Jesus. In your name I pray, amen.